to the research introductions on uh, nuclear physics and public policy. I'm Jerry Gelfoyle, uh, and uh, I'm guessing you can all hear me. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, I used to teach in this room without the microphone, so I'm guessing that I'm loud enough. Anyway, um, I, I think in the spirit that Kathy suggested, we want to keep this informal, so if you want to ask questions, feel free. Just wave your hand, and I can stop. What I'm going to talk about today is about two and a half talks mashed into probably about 50 minutes, hopefully. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about is some of the basic science uh, that I do in my research, uh, and also talk about a little sidelight that I got involved with, well, in some sense 30 years ago, but a little more seriously about 10 years ago, uh, involving mostly the application of my field, which is nuclear and particle physics. Uh, to issues related to public policy, in particular the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And then at the end of all that, uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about how you go about getting involved in science, uh, what sorts of things you can do, because there are a variety of sort of non-traditional tracks that you can end up doing that I'll mention uh, that are, are, are really cool. And uh, sort of one of the, 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 fr mo one of the most frustrating things about my job is I can't get to do all the cool stuff. So, um, and so with that, let me uh, start talking. I'm just gonna be very schizophrenic. I probably don't know which one I should point at. So, uh, I think I'll pick this one since y'all are closer to it. Um, the first part of my talk is gonna be about uh, basic science. Uh, this is a famous Sidney Harris uh, cartoon about the earliest form of the periodic chart uh, by the Greeks. And that's really closely tied, or there's a very nice line from uh, first Greek studying that to uh, what I'm going to be talking about in particular. Uh, here's just a quick outline on what I'm going to talk about. Like I said, I'm going to talk about basic science first, the study of matter, uh, tied into nuclear nonproliferation, and then talk a little bit about science careers. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is sort of what we know. All right, you know, what science is about mostly, most importantly, is what we don't know. But you want to start off about what we know. And right now, well, we know lots, okay? We know about the Big Bang, all right? We know, at least in, in, in a very real sense, the major outlines of the structure of the universe. Uh, we know a lot about geology, though we probably know less about the center of the Earth than we know about the limits of the universe. Uh, we know a little bit bio biology. And you start looking down in the atomic and subatomic world, and there's a lot of stuff that we know about. We can break atoms down in the nuclei and their electrons. We can take that nuclei, those nuclei, and split them apart into protons and neutrons. And we can even get down to where my research is focused, below that, where we look at the structure of protons and neutrons. To kind of get you in the mood, all right, I thought I'd put up something that's nice and familiar name of the periodic chart. And what this tells us is, you know, some people, you know, they call this the table of elements. Uh, it's not, we'll see the table of elements in a minute. Uh, but what this chart does is it takes the attributes of these atoms and basically arranges them, arranges them in a coherent way. And so typically as you go down a column, you're going in increasing mass, as you go across a row, you're looking at different charges, okay, in the nucleus and in the number of electrons. And so this is a way to kind of structure things uh, so that uh, you can see the, see the ordering and systematic behavior of these things. Well, the real table of elements is this thing up here in the right hand corner. All right, we can take those elements in the periodic chart, uh, tear them apart into protons and neutrons. We can actually then go and take and peer inside those protons and neutrons, and what we see are essentially six things that we call quarks, okay? I didn't name them, I didn't pick the names, not my fault. Uh, but <clears throat> they break down into a set of six quarks and six associated leptons, and so the, the, the table of elements right now is this thing, as best we know it, all right? Turns out that not unlike the periodic chart, uh, things are things have a certain structure. As you go down this table, things go up in mass. Uh, there's really three rows here, or generations, or families, as we call them. All right, each family has 
two quarks with it, and it has what's called a lepton and a, and a neutrino associated with it. Don't worry about all the details, but the idea here is that all the known matter that we know about in the universe, all right, can basically be built up by these 12 particles. At the same time, what's a little different than the picture of uh, the, the elements in the periodic chart that you may have been raised on is there's actually another set of particles that are the force carriers. And these govern the interactions among all the elements of this, uh, or all among the components of this elementary chart and determine you know, how they bind together, how they decay, how they interact with each other. So what we know is you can take protons and neutrons, look inside them, all right, and what you find is that a proton in particular is made up of three quarks, okay, two U's and a D, two ups and a down, or two U's and a D. <clears throat> Once you make those protons and neutrons, there's a force, well, before you, as you make them, there's a force that's called the strong force that binds them together. Uh, the the uh, particle that carries that force is a thing called the gluon, okay. Uh, I once told that to somebody and they didn't believe me, they thought I was making it up. And I said, well, it was made up, but it wasn't by me. And so these are literally the glue that holds most of us together. And so uh, once you make protons and neutrons, then you can make nuclei. Uh, the quarks have a very special feature that you can't get them out, okay? Every other type of particle or system we, we've looked at, whether it's the Earth-Moon system or uh, molybdenum or uranium or carbon, you can always ionize those things. You can take the constituents and take them apart. It turns out we can't do that down here. The quarks are essentially eternally trapped inside the particles they form. Yeah, almost. Uh, and then, of course, the protons and neutrons are not confined. We can actually pull them out of the nuclei. And, uh, oops, I jumped ahead. <clears throat> so this is what we know now. This is clearly not the end of the story, just as the periodic chart is not the final word on chemistry. And I just want to emphasize that with an analogy that I saw in a physics talk once, is this, is, this table here is not the whole story in the same way that this picture is not Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, all right? This is a histogram of the constituents of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, all right? These are all the notes and how often they occur, all right? Uh, but I would, I would challenge you to get the beauty and power of Beethoven's Fifth out of this histogram. And so the desire to understand how those quarks interact with one another and form protons and neutrons and ultimately nuclei is really the focus of my research. And a little bit more detail about what we're looking at. Uh, we understand, at least in some sense, the force that binds quarks together, this strong force. And there's a good reason to call it strong. This is a calculation of its value uh, based on a theory called quantum chromodynamics, uh, which was uh, the people that worked on that won the Nobel about six years ago. And if I take two quarks and put them near each other, the force between them is three tons, okay? These are two very, very light microscopic particles, 10 to the minus 15th meters apart, and the force between them is three tons, all right? So that would be several cars to pull them apart. Uh, holding them in, holding them in. So if you try and pull them apart, then it takes three tons to do it, three tons of force. <coughs> This picture works extremely well, and I'll show you how well in a moment, at very high energies. At the same time, we've done nuclear physics for 70 or 80 years, where we've looked at nuclei as composed of protons and neutrons. And we do not so bad with that, okay? We can account for kind of 60 or 70 percent of the properties of those nuclei with that picture. And in that picture, you get, uh, this, this shows you a thing called the potential energy as a function of the separation between a neutron and a proton. And this actually looks more like the kind of forces you see if you study the Earth-Moon system, uh, if you study more traditional physics. But the point here is these, this neutron and proton are bound together by the same force that binds the quarks together. But in this case, you form the protons and neutrons 
with your quarks, and there's a little bit of force left over, okay? Uh, now there's a little bit sort of outside the proton and neutron, and it's that little residual force, as it's called, which is responsible for forming nuclei. <clears throat> well, how well do we know things? Uh, there's lots of stuff on these, on these two plots. Don't worry about it. There's two things you want to get out of both of them. One is, if you look at the scale here, this goes from 1 to 10 million. Okay, this is a uh, semi-log scale. That's a big range. All right? The points on here, the different shapes and whatnot, they're different. They're data. They're measurements. The lines are theoretical calculations. Okay? Across a factor of 10 million, all right, the data, the theory agrees with the data, all right. This is a stupendous level of accuracy and agreement between a theoretical calculation and measured quantities, that you're basically getting it right uh, across a factor of 10 million. At the same time, and this is, this is based on QCD, this quantum chromodynamics, so this is based on studying quarks at the most fundamental level that we can reach right now. If I go back to this other picture, we call it the hadronic model, where we look at protons and neutrons as made, or nuclei as made up of protons and neutrons, that theory also does <coughs> extremely well. And if I look at the same two things here, okay, the scale here goes from 10 to the minus 9 to 10, a little over 10 to the minus 4. Okay, it doesn't go 10 million, it goes sort of 400,000, okay, in terms of scale. And if you look at here, the data points, all right, there's a number of theoretical calculations, but Wally Van Orden's calculation, he's a professor at ODU, all right, does, again, really quite well at, uh, at getting agreement between the calculation and the data. And so the point is, is that these two theories work very well. But this one works at very high energies. If you look here, these numbers are in the hundreds, okay? This one works at much lower energies. If you look at the numbers here, it's, they're a few, all right? And one of, the, one of the main focus foci of my research is to basically understand how we can try and merge these two pictures. Because what we know is that protons and neutrons are made up of quarks. And if I know what the constituents are up here, and I know what the force is, QCD, I should be able to calculate what the protons and neutrons and nuclei look like. It's very analogous to what was going on in physics in the late 40s and early 50s. We knew what the constituents of molecules were, their atoms, all right? We also had a theory for the force. Back then, it was called quantum electrodynamics. And we eventually, on the basis of that, constructed probably the most successful theory in, in the history of the human species. All right, there are QED calculations that are accurate out to about 16 uh, significant digits. And so it was extremely successful. And now what we're doing is we're now trying to do that uh, with quarks, okay? Uh, well, you know, it, you know, there's an old saying that, you know, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be research. If knew what the answer was coming up, we wouldn't be doing research on it. But there are some problems, okay, with what we don't know. What we know, what one of the things I talked about before, you and I are, are made up mostly of triplets of quarks, okay? Proton is two ups and a down, or two u's and a d, neutrons are two d's and a u, all right? And so they actually make up 99% of what we are. Okay, most of the mass is in the nucleus. 99% of the mass is in the nucleus. Most of it comes from, uh, from those quarks. Well, and so as I said, you know, a proton is two up to one down, you know, so we should be able to figure out what these things weigh. And from here in our periodic chart, we've got the mass down in this column, all right? And in the first row, I got the mass of the up and the mass of the down. So we should be able to calculate, say, the mass of a proton, which is two ups and a down. And so you can go do that, all right? Mass of a proton is twice the mass of the up up here, once the mass of the down. Okay, there's kind of funny units. Yeah, you know, it's just easier with these. You don't have big exponents you gotta drag around. But, you know, I, I'll bet you guys could all do this in your heads, all right? 
2 times 0.002, uh, that'd be 0 0.004, plus 0 0.005, and 0 0.009, plus or minus 10%, okay? So you can calculate that, you go and measure it, you're off by a factor of 100, okay? So the masses of the quarks do not add up to the mass of the thing they make, okay? And right now, we can calculate what that is, all right? Now, is this a complete disaster? Well, we, we sort of know in what physicists call a hand-waving way what the reason is for this discrepancy, okay? Remember the three tons, two quarks, all right, I put them close together, three tons of force if I try and pull them apart, okay? What that means is it's real strong, all right? What it also means is that the region between those quarks, I'm storing a huge amount of energy, okay? The energy density in the field between two quarks is extremely high. And there's this funny-haired guy from about 100 years ago by the name of Albert Einstein, and he really didn't do it this way, but he realized right around 105 years from like today that in fact, if I have energy that I can turn it into mass, all right? And so what that means is that high energy density between our two quarks can effectively constitute mass, all right? And so we know that the mass is in there, all right? But right now, we don't have a theory that, that can effectively calculate that, all right? We're working on it, and I'll talk more in a second, but the challenge here, one of the challenges of the type of research that I do is to come up with a fundamental theory that will enable us to solve this problem that, well, we kind of know there's all this energy stored in the region between the quarks where the fields are, where the force is at, all right? But right now, we can't really calculate it. Uh, <clears throat> well, we can't really calculate, but maybe soon, okay? These are some results. Again, don't worry too much about what this is on, on, the, on the vertical scale. It's essentially a measure of the currents inside the neutron, okay? But what this shows you is a quantity that uh, there's sort of three sets of data on here. There's the green stuff, all right, which is sort of the world's previous data before about a year and a half ago. Uh, it's a whole bunch of different experiments as you get up. This, oh, I lost the horizontal axis. Uh, this is essentially uh, energy along here, all right, so you're going to higher energy. And what happens here is you look at the green points, it's a whole bunch of different experiments. Uh, as you get up to higher energy, uh, the data, well, they suck, all right? Uh, basically, the error bars are big, all right? And so it's really hard, you know, you see some theoretical curves here. It's hard to distinguish between all of those curves uh, from these data. Well, we published, our group published about a year and a half ago, the data in blue, all right? So we more than doubled the world's data on this particular quantity. Uh, the other thing that's gonna be interesting is these are not real data, the points in black, all right? They're ones that I calculated from some systematic fits, but what they represent, more importantly, the things that are, well, the actual value of this quantity here, who knows what it's gonna be, all right, because we haven't measured it yet, but what, this, what the error bars on this, uh, on these points represent is a pretty realistic estimate of the error bar is an experiment that I'm gonna run in about four or five years, hopefully, if I'm lucky, all right? And the important thing here is that the error bars are nice and small, and so when you look at these different theoretical calculations from Jerry Miller and Mitch Gidal and then uh, Ian Chloe, that we'll be able to distinguish between these. Why do you care? Well, this red curve here, all right, from Ian Chloe and Craig Roberts, what they're doing that's so interesting is they're starting from a very fundamental approach to how the quarks interact. And they've been able to make predictions now for what this quantity should look like as a function of energy. And what happens is, is in the low energy region down here, well, the, all the curves are kind of close together. It's hard to distinguish them. But as you go to higher energy, these curves start to spread apart. And so what it means now is that if we can measure these data with these very nice error bars, is we can pick a winner, all right? We'll be able to tell which one of these theories actually does the best, OK? 
okay? And which one, and if Craig Roberts or Ian Chloe's calculation does the best, then it's gonna say that their approach to solving this, ma this missing mass problem is gonna be the correct one. And so that's the kind of thing that, that I'm working on uh, now and in the future. Uh, how do you go about doing all this stuff? Okay, it's very non-trivial. Uh, first you go out and you build yourself uh, a half a gigabuck accelerator, all right? That would be $500 million, all right? This is a machine that's actually not too far down the road in Newport News, uh, and what we have down there is a large electron accelerator. It's essentially like a really, really big electron microscope, except when I say really big, okay, it takes me a while to run around here. When I'm running around there, it's about seven-eighths of a mile around. Uh, this road is a racetrack, or a, a, it's just a road that sits above the actual accelerator. This is the tunnel down here with the accelerating elements, some of our students. And so what you do is you build yourself one of those, uh, <coughs> as shown here. Uh, the next thing you need is a big detector. Uh, oh, let me just say, we start off, you accelerate your electrons around here, you pull them out of the accelerator, and you send them into these three little humpy things down here where the uh, experimental halls are located. Uh, we give them very creative names, halls A, B, and C. Uh, hall A is the highest point in Newport News. Um, <clears throat> I work in Hall B, which is the middle one, and it's this thing here, all right? This is a big sort of spherical detector that surrounds a target. Uh, the beam comes in from the back, the target's buried down in the center of this, and what happens is those electrons will scatter off the quarks and the constituents of the target, and they get sprayed in all directions, and our detector can capture those. Uh, and needless to say, you need lots of people, all right? You need lots of other physicists and technical <coughs> support. You need lots of students to do all your work for you. And what we ultimately will measure is essentially a diffraction pattern. And I should put Peter on the spot and see if he recognizes this. You do? Good, this is photo 51, this is DNA. All right, this is an X-ray diffraction pattern. This is an electron diffraction pattern measured at a lab, at, I think Mainz, at a lab not unlike uh, this lab, Jefferson Lab. <coughs> and what, that, what this information, what this distribution tells you and this is plotted as a function of momentum kick, how much of a kick you gave to the target, is it tells you in this case where the electron char or the electric charge is inside your nucleus, and that's what this inset shows you. And so that's the type, the type uh, that's what we go, how we go about doing it. Uh, the detector that we use is this thing, it's called CLASS, all right? When you work at a government lab, you need lots of acronyms, and this is, the accelerator is called the Continuous Electron Beam Accelerator Facility, this is the, or CBAF, this is the CBAF Large Acceptance Spectrometer, okay? Uh, big complicated device, spherical in nature, this is a cutaway drawing showing you lots and lots of layers of detecting equipment that will actually capture the tracks of particles that are created when the electron beam comes in the back and then strikes a target <coughs> down here in the center. Uh, and you can give it some idea of the scale of this thing. And this is actually a picture of an event if I took a slice down through the middle of one, of the, one portion of this detector, this is what an event looks like. What you see are many layers of detection equipment, and the little red dots are basically the tracks of electrons and pions and lots of other types of particles that come out of these things. Lots of different technologies that go into this. I'm going to talk about just one for a brief moment. Uh, there's a couple, there's these thin layers out here okay, which correspond to the red panels in this picture. Those are called time of flight scintillators. Okay, they're scintillators. There's also a bunch of scintillators in these big devices out here. This is called a calorimeter. It measures the energy. Those are the green things in this picture. What these things do is when particles go through them, they make a little burst of light. And the sort of miracle of how they work is as those particles go through, they will dump some energy in the material, all right? What that does is that excites the atoms. And then what happens is this very sort of magical thing is you excite the atoms to some higher excited energy levels, all right? And those energy levels can actually interact. This is now in the nucleus, all right? It's 100,000 times smaller than, uh, <coughs> uh, than the atom. 
those nuclei, those excited states in the nuclei will interact with one of these distant electrons, all right, and get rid of a bunch of its energies and pass it out to the electron. The electron gets injected. What happens then is that, that excited nucleus de-excites a little bit, and then it de-excites a lot. When it, when it does that last big de-excitation, de it emits some light. The important thing is that light is not the same color, okay, or same energy of the light that caused the original excitation. If it was, then it would just get absorbed in the material. But it isn't, and it turns out that we can actually get that light out. And so we can detect these particles as they come in. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> that's how it works. Uh, a quick summary is basically the work that we're doing at JLab is really uh, changing our whole view of what matter looks like at one of its most fundamental levels. But now I'm going to shift gears, okay, and I'm going to come back to these scintillators, all right, a few slides down the road. But I'm going to shift gears to a very different, what looks like an extremely different type of topic. And now for something completely different. And it's not that, but it's this, okay. Uh, this is basically an adaptation of a talk I gave in April uh, on the science of nuclear nonproliferation. All right, this is actually a French nuclear test from the 60s. Uh, and what I'm going to do is talk to you, give you a very rapid introduction to uh, how nuclear weapons work. And then I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, spend most of the time talking about what's called the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And then hopefully I will convince you about why you might want to care about this. Uh, nuclear weapons, uh, the way they work is surprisingly simple. There are some materials out there like uranium and plutonium that what you can get them to do is if you can shoot a neutron into them, then you will excite those nuclei. They'll start wiggling around and eventually break in two, a process called fission. Okay, Not the biological fission, but the nuclear one. When they fission, they also typically emit a couple of neutrons. Well, those neutrons can wander out, and if they're lucky, they'll hit another fissile nucleus, excite it, and make it fission. And so you can have this, what's called a chain reaction, where as one nucleus fissions, it makes two, it makes four, which makes eight, and so on. Now, the way you make that happen, though, is normally if you just hold a chunk of uranium in your hand, it won't happen because the nuclei are not packed close together enough, and so the neutrons get out without, without actually causing uh, other fission. And so what you gotta do is take this, squeeze it down nice and tight, and then you get a very massive and rapid energy release. That's one type, the other type, that's a fission bomb. If I set off a fission bomb, and I happen to have a little bit of deuterium and tritium, okay, this is a proton and a neutron, and this is a proton and two neutrons. If I have a little bit of that floating around, then those will actually fuse, all right, and make helium four and a neutron. All right, this is what powers the sun. This is now a fusion reaction, all right? And if you do that, then that also releases a lot of energy. The thing that makes people nervous is I can do this with eight kilograms of plutonium. That's about uh, a beer can's worth. Uh, or 25 kilograms of highly enriched uranium, eh, six pounds, not quite, maybe, all right? So it takes fairly small amounts of material to actually make these things go boom. <clears throat> a little bit more about basic weapons design. Uh, there's two fundamental types. There's the gun type, nuclear weapon. What you do is you take a slab of uranium, uh, another slab of uranium, you stick it in a gun and shoot them at each other. Okay, and it's really not much more complicated than that, all right? And so uh, the, the big hard part with all these things is making enough, getting enough uranium. And this is essentially the, the uh, weapon that was dropped on Hiroshima, okay? Uh, this is so easy to do that the Hiroshima weapon was never tested. They were so sure that it would work the first time. The other type, which is relevant only for sort of very advanced countries like the U.S. and Russia is what's called this two-stage thermonuclear weapon. Uh, you have a fission bomb in here, a different design, all right? Uh, this is made out of plutonium. You make a shell of the metal. You surround it with high explosive, 
All right, you set off that high explosive, and what that does is that squeezes the plutonium down so it gets dense enough to reach a critical mass, you get your chain reaction, and, and you run away rapidly, okay? What can also happen here is when this thing goes off, the pressure of the light that comes off of this thing is big enough to squeeze this device down here, which has a little bit of deuterium and tritium gas in it, all right? As that light wave squeezes that material down, it gets dense enough and hot enough that you initiate fusion reactions, all right? So you get additional energy release. And then in fact, usually you put in a little stick of uranium at the end so that it starts to fission again. So, uh, so this is actually a fission-fusion fission bomb, which is the type that's on many in the US arsenal and in the Russian arsenal. <coughs> Anyway, and then I have this in here because this is just kind of a really interesting picture. Uh, this is a nuclear explosion uh, a millisecond in when the fireball is about 20, 60 feet, 65 feet across. Okay, um, so the camera probably didn't survive this. Um, but that's what it looks like initially. So those are the basic design features, uh, effects. Uh, if you look real close, you might recognize some of these. Uh, what you get here, this is a Google map of us right now, where we are, okay? The dot in the center is not the dot, it's about the size of the crater, be about a thousand feet across, if we set off a weapon about the size of the Hiroshima bomb. Uh, this first ring out here, which goes out past three chop, almost to Patterson, that's the five PSI, five pound per square inch radius, all right? Basically, that knocks all the buildings down. All right, so all the buildings go away from here out to Patterson Avenue. Uh, the next ring here is if you're out sunning yourself, uh, when it goes off, you get second degree burns from the pulse of light from this thing out to, well, uh, that's past Monument, that's Broad Street, so. Um, and so this shows you the size of the effect. This just talks a little more detail about where the energy of the blast goes. Um, needless to say, you don't want to be anywhere near this, okay, if such a thing actually went off. And so that, of course, is the concern. Remember, uh, eight, eight kilograms of plutonium, 25 kilograms, you know, or six pack of uranium uh, can create damage uh, like this. Uh, <clears throat> well, one thing, almost from the time that the bombs, the first bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, there's been an ongoing effort try and restrict and control the spread of nuclear weapons. Uh, over the last sort of 15 years, one of the major developments in that has been the development of what's called the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, and it's really very simple. Basically, it says you can't test these things, all right? If you build a weapon, you're not allowed to set it off. The idea being is that if countries want to start up and build a nuclear arsenal, they will only have faith in whether it will work. It will only pass what's called the general's test, all right? Uh, and that just means that the generals have to approve it. They trust it enough that if they want to use it in conflict, uh, that it will actually work. And so the idea is that if you ban testing, then you basically cut out one of the major steps in developing a weapon. What the treaty is built on is it is not built on trust, okay? What it's built on is a series of essentially detectors, okay? The most important of which, the first sort of line of defense in this are essentially seismometers. They basically measure how much the ground shakes, all right? The idea being is that if you set off one of these things underground and try to hide it, all right, that we'll be able to detect it. And in fact, this, these systems are now so sensitive that they can actually, they detect lots of earthquakes, uh, they can detect chemical explosions used in uh, construction. And <clears throat> so that's the general idea. It also has other provisions, including on-site in, uh, inspections, if it's suspected that you actually set one of these things off. Uh, the U.S. has signed the CTBT. It signed it many years ago, uh, but never ratified it. It was first uh, signed in 1999 uh, when Bill Clinton was president, and he sent it to the Senate to be ratified. Uh, they were busy with uh, the Monica Lewinsky uh, adventure at the time and uh, did not ratify it. Uh, 
this picture here just shows you a map where all the sensors are located, okay? And so there's a bunch in the U.S., a bunch in China, a bunch in Russia. We don't have any up there, which is where the Russian test site is right now. It's probably too cold. Uh, you know, we even, you know, if the penguins try and set off any weapons down here in Antarctica, we'll be able to catch them, too. And so this is a theory, or a theory, a treaty, uh, which is focused on trying to cut out uh, one of the major steps that countries have to go through to acquire a nuclear weapon. Well, how well does it work, all right? Because you can sort of talk all you want, but if something happens, can we actually use it? And when I was making up this talk, I decided, well, you know, let me talk about something that is sort of in the news, okay? Well, one of the things that was in the news four years ago is the North Koreans set one off, all right? They have a test facility at Pung Yi in the northeastern part. Uh, this is a picture of it, so you can see the access roads and uh, the tunnels that go into the underground, uh, uh, in the underground cave where they actually set these things off. <clears throat> so they set one off. Part of the INS, or the IMS, the International Monitoring System for the CTBT was active at that point. In fact, 20 IMS stations detected it. Uh, the yield was very small. People suspected it basically didn't work, all right? <clears throat> and so we knew they had done it. Okay, we knew where, we were able to locate where, we had an estimate for the size, and this was four years ago. Uh, but interestingly enough, and this goes back to the technology we talked about earlier for the detector at JLab, was that not only did we detect the seismic signal from this weapon, but when this thing went off, apparently some of the gases created in the explosion vented from that tunnel that we saw up there they drifted across the Pacific Ocean and ended up here in beautiful, sunny Northwest Territory, Canada. And one of the IMS stations here, you can sort of see why it's sunny and funny up here, actually was able to detect uh, the signature of a nuclear explosion uh, about two weeks after the thing went off. And I just want to talk for a minute about the science of this, because the science of this is really very impressive. Um, how did we actually do it? Uh, the way you do it is you take a lot of nuclear physics, chemistry, engineering, uh, meteorology, high power computing, and you put all that together, all right? Well, the way you do it is what nuclear blasts produce are xenon. Xenon's not around very much. The only way you can find it is if some, somebody made it. And it turns out that one of the isotopes, one of the forms of xenon produced in a nuclear blast, decays in a very unique uh, way. And what it does is it emits essentially an electron, okay? And so that essentially turns a neutron into a proton. And so when that happens, you make cesium, cesium-133. And that cesium is in a higher excited state. And then that higher excited state very quickly loses that energy and emits a photon. And so what this xenon isotope, the xenon-133 does, is it in rapid su succession emits an electron and then a photon. Well, what that means is that that's a very unique signal, and so it's a good identifier that you found some xenon. And so what you do is you drive or fly uh, to Yellowknife. I don't think you can drive it. You gotta either fly or walk over the ice bridges or whatever. Uh, what you set, what was set up by the uh, IMS up there was a system where you build yourself a really big pump, all right? You suck in lots of air, and then you do lots of essentially chemistry on it. You have molecular sieves, activated charcoal. You do all this filtering, all right? You send it through a gas chromatograph, another molecular sieve, and eventually, you send it into a nuclear radiation detector. And that radiation detector is just like the type of detectors that we're using at JLab to detect the scattering of electrons from quarks. What this thing does, is this is a real nifty detector, the plastic scintillator, the scintillator that I talked about before, there's two kinds of it here. You take a little cylinder of it, and this little pipe in here runs in here and runs the xenon gas that's gone through all these sieves and whatnot into this little cylinder of scintillator, all right? 
And what happens there is eventually one of these xenon 133s will spit out its electron. Electrons don't go very far in, in matter. They, they, they lose all their energy and stop pretty quickly. So the electrons come out and they, they actually hit and stop and make a bunch of light in uh, the scintillator uh, that, that forms this, c this cylinder. The photons, on the other hand, they go through lots of stuff. And so they go right through this little cylinder, but then this whole thing is embedded inside a thing called a sodium iodide crystal, which is another radiation detector optimized to detect these photons. And so you capture the electron in here in your plastic scintillator, and then you have this crystal which does the same job, but much better for, uh, for electrons, and so you capture both of these things, okay? Well, does this work? Well, sure it does, otherwise it wouldn't be telling me about it. Uh, but it's not quite that simple, all right? You go and you measure this stuff, you see your sign of one uh, xenon 133, but that's, that, that may be a smoking gun, but you gotta make sure you get the right one. And so the other piece of this is you gotta be a good meteorologist with a really powerful computer. And what you do is you basically use the known weather and you predict where if I had a release of the xenon here at Pyongyi, this shows you how that, that gas bubble that comes out from the nuclear explosion evolves over a couple weeks. And what you find is after a couple weeks, which is right around here, that this shows you the blue stuff, blue and purple shows you that there should be some xenon-133 around the region right there where our, uh, where our monitoring station is located. Um, that's fine, you also gotta worry about other stuff because there could be false positives. Remember I said that xenon is man-made, but it's not made just in nuclear explosions. Uh, these are, this, this is a, a, a sampling from that station. You see these big peaks here, that's xenon, that's from a drug company, okay? That are making pharma radio pharmaceuticals at, uh, at a reactor, this is Chalk River, way on the other side of Canada, okay? but this system can pick those up. This little nibble down here is our North Korean explosion. What this shows you here is this is the actual data. This is the prediction from this atmospheric modeling. And so they predicted you'd see a peak around the 23rd or 4th, and they saw a peak right around the 22nd. And so this was confirmation that the North Koreans had set off a blast and that we had actually detected uh, the xenon from it. <coughs> Well, you know, they had, the North Koreans had so much fun doing that. The first time that what they then did, uh, just a little over a year ago, a year and a half ago, they set off another one. This time, remember, there was 20 stations detected it. This time, 61 got it. It was a little bigger. We had more stations in place. Uh, but then the big surprise was no one detected any radio xenon. There's no xenon. Uh, that we detected in any of the stations when we should have. We actually, by, by 2009, there were several stations near the Korean Peninsula that should have detected this. And so this was something of a controversy, all right? And, you know, the question was, well, what went wrong? Why aren't we detecting this stuff? And this is actually where the story gets interesting, or maybe sad in some ways. The North Koreans, could they have faked the explosion? because people were worried about, well, maybe they can make us think they set off a nuclear blast. Well, they would have had to uh, uh, move in something like uh, 5,000 tons of dynamite to actually do this. And I actually figured out it would take hundreds of trucks, okay, in order to carry that much dynamite. Uh, there's no sign of that. We sit there and we watch these guys from our satellites. Don't see a lot of trucks coming in and out. Uh, was it sealed, okay? <clears throat> From my experience in the field, I thought, well, these, these gases get out all the time. Well, turns out I was wrong. Between 1971 and 1992, the last time we did a test, we set off 335 nuclear weapons to test these things. Of those 335, only six actually released anything, okay? So we knew how to seal the things off, okay? Well, how did the North Koreans know that? Well, they just read the stuff that we published on it. Okay, they Googled it, okay? And so they probably just were able to figure out how to actually seal the thing, and so what they did was they sealed it. And so the question comes, and, and this is actually, this information came from a study that just came out like a 
a week before I gave this talk in, uh, in April. And so the question is, is are the seismic sensors enough? And it turns out that, well, I mean, you can uh, read, I mean, I'm not the expert on this, but the, the, the two major societies of geologists have in fact stated that with the technology we have now, we can detect all explosions down to a kiloton, uh, much less over a lot of large uh, areas, and we can also nail down the location very tightly. And this was actually just uh, a few, well, a year ago now. And so it'll work. Uh, why should you care about all this? Well, the president has actually committed, at least publicly, that he will bring CTBT to a vote. Okay, so this is now going to become a political issue at some point. Uh, there is, amazingly enough, Republican opposition to this. Okay, Senator John Kyle, Republican from Arizona, has said the following. Uh, basically, uh, the monitoring system failed to collect necessary radioactive gases and particulates to prove that a test had occurred. Okay, and so what one side of the aisle is saying that, oh, we don't know that they really set off a nuclear explosion, even though the seismic data clearly indicate that. And just to give the other side, this is a quote from a report by the National Academy of Science, Sciences that looked at some years ago at the technical issues related to the treaty that basically saying that in, you know the worst case scenario when you don't have a CTBT is actually much greater, uh, much bigger threat than if you do have it. And so the point here is this is an issue where there's some very serious science, okay, that is impacting and going to have an impact in the political arena, already has 10 years ago, and will likely do that in the future. And so this type of thing will affect, uh, should affect, uh, or impact uh, how you all vote uh, in the future. Let me go, yeah, let me skip that because I'm talking too long. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about science careers, okay? Uh, how I got involved in this and how uh, you all and other people can get involved in this. Um, <clears throat> some of this stuff you may already know. Uh, to me, the best way to get involved in science is number one, read, okay? And you know, you don't have to read the journals. You don't have to read physical review. Uh, I, I really like Bill Bryson's book on the short history of nearly everything, um, even though he doesn't pretend to be uh, a scientist. Uh, there's a guy, Richard Preston. He's written, how many people here have ever read Hot Zone? Yeah, that just scares the crap out of you, doesn't it? Okay. Anyway, he's written a bunch of other stuff. This is about astronomy. This is about uh, bio war. This is about big trees. Okay. This is a very cool book about the redwoods. Um, the other thing to do, and this is more relevant to you, you all, is get involved in research somehow. Okay either here with the faculty uh, or try to get jobs in industry or hospitals or where you're doing something technical. Uh, you know, if you don't want to do that, you know, it's really, it's really easy to get jobs if you don't accept pay, all right? And so one of the things you can do is volunteer. Go, just go and find in your local or even in the federal government uh, uh, committees or elected officials that work on science. I mean, uh, Markey's first name, Massachusetts. Richard Markey? Yeah, Richard Markey is a congressman from Massachusetts uh, who's been involved in a lot of issues uh, related to science. And so there, there are sort of science-oriented people. There's uh, Russ Holt in New Jersey uh, who, who focus a lot on scientific issues. Uh, there's non-governmental organizations like these, Federation of American Scientists. Um, if they're near you, if you live, especially if you live near DC, you know, these guys all have offices there. You can go work for them for free. They'll probably take you. Um, ask questions. Uh, learn about stuff. Learn what's important. Learn where the, where the field that you like is going. Uh, just to let you know where the money is going and who does what. This shows you uh, uh, federal funding of research over the last sort of 40 ish or so years. Uh, the big uh, thing that's risen over that time, this is mostly the National Institutes of Health. So there's a lot of biomedical research getting funded now, though I know they're not very happy because this is now going down, all right? 
Uh, engineering, the physical sciences have been pretty stable over the years. Um, but this gives you a feel for sort of where federal money goes uh, to fund research. And so whether you're looking at it as someone with a bachelor's degree or further down the road, someone with a more advanced degree, uh, these are the sorts of areas where, where you can get funding. Uh, one of the interesting things that I've learned in preparing this was the impact of business on research funding. Um, focus on the right-hand panel up here. This shows you over the last half century or so uh, the amount of money uh, provided by business, which is the dot dash line or dotted line, versus the federal government, which is this one down here. Uh, back in the 50s and 60s, it was dominated by the federal government. It's now dominated more by business. Um, be a little bit careful. This is actually this plot. This this one is research money, this one is research and development, okay? So that's a little further down the line in terms of getting the market. Uh, and so what this is saying is that companies now do uh, a lot of research, and industry is a very active place. And then the last thing uh, I wanna put up is, you know, go learn about stuff. And one of the best places to learn is the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, I spent a year working in government Peter Smallwood down here also spent a year working in government among other places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, but they have all sorts of information from how to run your lab, okay, I wish I would have had this a while back, to if, if you don't want to stay in science and stay in a lab, all right, if you want, if you get a degree, a bachelor's degree or a PhD and you would like to use that, you would like to do science but not in a lab setting, okay. When I was working in D.C., I met a guy, eh, late 20s or so, bachelor's degree in physics, basically ran all the programs, okay, or he got it, he worked for GAO, Government Accounting Office. He was the one that evaluated all of our programs, we've been doing this for about 20 years now, we're basically chopping up the Russian nuclear missiles and, and chopping up their nuclear weapons. He was the one that was evaluating our progress towards that, okay? And so this is, I mean, that's a really cool thing, okay? That you're basically dismantling a Soviet weapons complex. When I was working in the Department of Defense, they would send, they were the ones that actually did the chopping, okay? And they would send managers over there for, over to Siberia, okay? You know, for a year, a year, a year at a time. It was a very hard duty. Okay, Siberia is just not a real happening spot to spend your life. They never had uh, somebody quit that quit that job because what they did was they took uh, retired military, hired them, and those guys had to train their entire careers to face you know a Soviet Warsaw Pact attack. Okay, through Germany. And what they were doing is they were spending time in Russia, all right, dismantling their nuclear weapons. And so those guys, as hard as that job was, they had so much enthusiasm for it that none of them ever quit, okay? Because all their training leading up when they were active military was focused on stopping the Soviet threat, and now they were getting to do it. Um, and let me stop there and open up for questions and everything.